In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've been having readings from the book of Job for the past several Sundays. Job, that book in the Old Testament in which Job probably represents the Old Testament image of Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But as I was reading over these passages, one of the old gospel hymns came to mind. In the sweet by and by, we shall understand it better by and by. We shall understand it better by and by. In the morning when the, in the, morning when the sun is risen, saints of God are gathered home, we shall tell the story of how we've overcome. We shall tell the story of how we've under overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. What's he talking about? Understand what? Of course, in the book of Job, the one thing we want to try to understand is why suffering, and why, why especially for good people, why do bad things happen to good people. And Job knows that he's good. He's followed every letter of the law. Even God acknowledges that in the story. Just take a look at my servant Job down there. And of course, the story of Job has the, has the idea of uh, God meets with Satan and gives Satan permission to inflict everything he can on Job, but do not take his life. And just see how Job holds up with all of the suffering. And you know, I got to thinking, in my life, there have been times in which I've been like Job. I want to know why. And there have been times in your life, I'm sure, in which God has seemed distant. I look to the right, you're not there. I look to the left, you're not there. Everywhere I turn, you're not there. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had experiences kind of that way? Most of us being human have. We have. And I want us to focus on how Jesus dealt with it. Number one, Jesus prayed to know what God's will was. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his trial and crucifixion? Lord, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But not my will, but what? Yours be done. How often are we able to pray that in the midst of suffering? I think more, we're more like Job, and we want to be justified. We want to know why. We want to know why. Of course, Job has confidence that ultimately he will see God, and God will hear his case. And at the last, I know that he shall stand, and I shall stand before him, and I shall know, and I shall hear from him, as a friend and not a stranger. Toward the end of Job, not where we are right now in our story and our reading. How do we contrast that and Jesus' words hanging on the cross where he quotes Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm goes on, and from the voice of my complaint. Why hast thou forsaken me? You ever felt that way? I know I can say I have. One of the things we have in Jesus that makes a great deal of difference to you and me is hope. And now abide faith, hope, and love. Although the greatest of these is love, hope is there. And what is the Christian hope? Resurrection. New life. New life that can begin right here and right now. 
And we're baptized into those three things in baptism, in baptism, into a pattern like Jesus, die, burial, resurrection. Death to the old in order that new life can come about. Most of us stay in the tomb, don't we? You know, a little fearful of what that new life might look like. Even though the old one has, you know, given us much hope, we're still in the same old rut, doing the same old things, the same old way, wanting a different result every time. We don't get that. We'll get the same results if we keep doing the same old thing in the same old way. God wants to say, see it differently. See it differently. Make some new tracks. Every day. Every day. Being born again every day. Our hope, the hope that comes from being a Christian and being baptized and living that new life. See, Job doesn't consciously make this decision to suffer with all this stuff going on. It's one that hmm, God gives. Jesus prayed about it and then willingly took it on. In your own life, have you ever willingly taken on crosses for other people? Have you ever picked them up and helped them carry them? Have you? I dare say most of us have. I think that number one, we could not understand, but we stood beside the person and walked with them very much the way Jesus walked with us. And in today's epistle, the writer of Hebrews reminds us, we don't have a high priest that's so distant from us that he doesn't understand. We have one who was in every way tempted as we are, that did not sin. So we have a God who basically walks with us through the suffering, through the times of darkness, through the dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross would call it. A God who walks with us in the darkness, in the darkness, in the midst of wanting to understand better by and by. A God who walks with us through the darkness and in the midst of suffering. I probably shared this with you before, but going through one great period like that in my life, I was ready to give up the priesthood, give up everything, turn it down. And I put a great deal of confidence in dreams. I pay attention to my dreams. I suggest you do too. But I was in the midst of a depression and this sort of thing. And I had a dream one night of seeing myself in a very, very deep pit. So deep I couldn't climb out of it. And a rope was offered me over the side. I didn't take it. I was too much in the pity pit. There I was. A ladder was placed under no. I choose to stay right here. I was sitting on a large rock, and there was another large rock down at the sort of end of the pit. And I happened to look at the figure sitting on the rock and doing just like I was, sitting just like this, head down. And I raised my head and my eyes and looking at what, hey, he's with me. He's doing the same thing I am. The figure was Christ. The figure was Jesus. And he was there with me. Powerful dream. It helped pull me out of that depression. Help me to remember that in the darkness, when we don't understand why, the answer we get is, Jesus, I'm with you in the midst of this, and you will understand it better by and by, but right now, I'm with you, and I'm walking beside you. 
and I'm upholding you and supporting you. We often forget that, don't we? Every Sunday I need the reminder, the Eucharist in which God feeds me and gives me strength to get through the pain, the suffering, the darkness. And Christ's promise to us is there is light at the end of the tunnel. And by the way, there's light even in your darkness. That's the power of the Easter Vigil. There is light even in your darkness. There is resurrection. And what is it going to take in your life and mine for us to move out of the tomb, out of the darkness, into Easter and new life? I know for me sometimes it's giving up old habits and old ways of doing things. It's letting go and sharing sometimes some of the many gifts that God has given. It's taking care of the neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Anyone in need. Especially we're told to be aware of that in the household of faith church in order to have the prayers and be supported by our fellow members one of the things we need to do is acknowledge our illness our sickness when that occurs and acknowledge our need our need for each other I am not an island unto myself although I might think I am and over the years I've been supported over and over again by both the prayers of God's people, by their encouragement, by their gifts of food, by their gifts of help and aid. That's what being a part of this marvelous community is about. So my wish for you is that you learn to remember that in those times of darkness, where there doesn't seem to be an answer, God is silent. Look for him in the presence of people who come to you, who offer you a card of things, encouragement, food, clothing, visits. Whatever it is, I assure you, Christ is there and present. May you come to realize it more and more in your life and may I do also. Amen. Standing as we are able, let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, 